you're having a higher or greater or greater amount of water weight above you. That's doing the same thing. You have a column now of water weight which is pushing down on you. And water clearly has a much higher density than air, and thus even small amounts of water, say if you were under, say, about 12 feet, exerts much greater times the amount of pressure than atmosphere does, even when our atmosphere is extending miles up into above the surface of the Earth. So for this reason, that's part of the rationale of why you have higher pressures as you get deeper and deeper. In fact, if you went deeper and deeper below the ocean, eventually, if, say, if you were in a submarine, unless it was a specially made submarine, that submarine would actually buckle and crack. And I believe it's, for America, our nuclear attack submarines have a safe distance that they could deploy. It's about a quarter, a fifth to a quarter of a mile. Those that are the heavy bombers, those that have the nuclear weapons, they can go down even further to hide there. But only those which are made specifically to withstand incredible depths and pressures can go any farther than that. And in particular, in World War II, the submariners, which they couldn't go down as far as they can now, they used to do a simple trick to see if they were going down too far. Think of it as just a cylinder. So say from this room to this room, if you really can't see the cylindrical aspect. They would just tie a wire, a rope, basically when they were at sea level. That rope is taut, so it's basically a straight line parallel to the ground. And as they went deeper and deeper, the ship was actually buckling, so it was getting smaller and smaller, and that rope would end up dipping downwards. And eventually, if it dipped too much, that meant that the rivets and bolts would eventually pop, water would come in, and thus your submarine is sunk. So this literally happens for objects. But in our case, let me define for you what one atmospheric pressure is, or one atmosphere of pressure. So one atmosphere of pressure, one atmosphere, is just going to be defined as 101.325 kilopascals, where PA stands for a pascal. One pascal is equivalent to one newton per meter squared. And thus looking at this, one atmosphere, which is about 101 kilopascals, or 101 thousand pascals is equivalent to be about, of course, 101.325 times 10 to the fifth Newton per meter squared. So one atmosphere is about, I'm sorry, not 101, just one. Let me change that. So 1.01. So about it's on the order of about 10,000 newtons per meter squared. And if you ended up doing this in English units, this is approximately equivalent to 14.7 pounds per square inch. And that's one atmosphere. That's the amount of pressure exerted by our atmosphere. So, on the order of 10,000 newtons per meter squared. So, that may sound like a lot, but clearly we can easily withstand that amount of pressure. So with this, let's do a simple example. And for this simple example, Let's say that you have a scuba diver. In a lake, or rather, yeah, in a lake. So lake basically means water. Because if I change what the actual liquid was, then I would have to change other parts of this problem as well. So a scuba diver in a lake made of water is at a depth of eight meters.
And what I want to find for this is A, what the pressure is, and B, what the total force is. where we will consider that this scuba diver, that the back of this scuba diver is basically a rectangle, so just to make life easier for ourselves, and this rectangle will be on the order of 60 centimeters by 50 centimeters, which sort of makes sense for a back. So this is what I want to end up doing, to find the pressure and the total force exerted on this scuba diver. Now looking at this, we don't have enough information to actually solve this. We don't have enough information yet because we haven't dealt with the idea of pressure and fluids, which is now what I want to do. So we're going to get back to this example, and we will end up proving or solving for this based upon some very simple arguments and a little bit of algebra. It always turns out to be a little bit of algebra for everything. So, before we're able to solve this, let's consider that we have a container, and let's just say that we have water in this container. And let's just say that we are interested in particular what the pressure is at the bottom. So let me just call this the pressure of B at the bottom. And let's say it's a mass, for example. So it's some type of mass. It doesn't have to be but some type of object which has some type of area. So with that in mind, let me basically draw here a region in which this represents the surface area of this object, such as if I had this piece of paper at the bottom, what I'm basically doing is drawing a three-dimensional rectangular, which is in the same shape as this. So that it has the surface area, that's the surface of the paper, if this paper was on the bottom of this water. It is at a depth of h, or you can say that to be a height h, from the bottom of this container to the water level. Whichever way you prefer to think of that as a depth below the water or as a height from its position to the top of the water level, it's given as that distance is h. So, this is contained with water. It could be any fluid, but in this case, let's stick with water since that's what I'm going to be discussing in a moment. This water clearly has a mass m. If I just basically say, if it's going to be uniform, then the center of mass would be about at h over 2. That's not necessary for us, but that's where it would be. So this whole column here has a mass m that's being exerted on the bottom. Because of that, just as we saw before, there will be a total weight, which is equivalent to mg, that will be pulling down on it. Just what we see here on our happy friend, who has this column of air of total weight mg, that's a force flying downward on him. Here we have on the bottom of this water, we have a total mass of the water m, which is just in that three-dimensional volume with a surface area a. Also, what we cannot neglect is that up here we have the air. Because we have the air, what's being exerted on the top of the water level is a pressure. And that pressure is equal to the pressure of their atmosphere, which is what I give you over here, where one atmosphere is just the mass of all the air. So basically consider all of the air, mass air times g, this is the weight that's being applied to it. So there is a pressure being applied on the top of the water level and that pressure will also relay downwards. But, of course, we have to deal with this weight as well. 
So we have the pressure from the atmosphere and we have the weight of the water. And remember, pressure is just force divided by area. So we have to deal with two things. This is already a pressure, meaning the weight divided by the same area here. And we have to deal with the weight of the water divided by the area there. So let's see if we can put this into a nicer formula for ourselves. So, weight is mg. The volume of this three-dimensional area, so this dimensional, three-dimensional area, the column of water that's on top of the bottom, that is just equivalent to the surface area A multiplied by the height, or depth, however you wish to think about it. The mass density rho, that's just going to be mass divided by volume. And that's what we see here is it's the mass of the water. I mean, just leave it as m to be as general as possible. So this doesn't have to be water. Maybe this is some other liquid that can exist. Divided by a times h as the volume. Well, there's something else we already know. Something we see here. Mass is rho times volume. That's just from the definition of mass density. For our purposes, volume is equal to AH. So that means the mass is equal to rho, the mass density, times AH. So looking at this, let's put back what weight is. Weight is equal to mg. M, we see clearly what that is. The mass is related to rho, the mass density, multiplied by the volume, which is the surface area, A, multiplied by the height of this column, or depth of the water, H, and multiplied by G, the gravitational acceleration. That's what we get for weight. Pressure, well, that's just equal to the total force divided by the surface area. The total force here is the weight divided by the surface area. And if we put this in, the weight, as we just saw, is going to be the mass density rho multiplied by the surface area, multiplied by the height, multiplied by g, the gravitational acceleration. And now to get pressure, we're dividing it by that same surface area, A. They will cancel each other out. And thus, what we get is, just looking at any column now, we are not putting it here yet, so I haven't solved for pressure at the bottom, just any normal pressure due to any weight being exerted from above it, that pressure in general is just going to be rho g h. So the pressure due to any mass, any weight that's weighing down on you, assuming of course, it doesn't have to be uniform, but here we're assuming it's uniform, is the mass density rho multiplied by the gravitational acceleration g and multiplying by the height of that column of mass. In the case of air, that would be, say, the total column from your head, or shoulders rather, all the way to the upper atmosphere, which in fact is only about, most of it's three miles above your head, so not very high. And in this case, in terms of the depth h, if we put them together now, then the pressure at the bottom has to be equal to the pressure on the top. Let me write here. This is pressure on top plus the pressure due to the weight. And so the pressure on the bottom going to be equal to the pressure on top, which is just the atmospheric pressure. So that will be P due to the atmosphere, which in numerical numbers is given to you right there, about 10,000 newtons per meter squared, plus the pressure of the weight, which is just rho, the mass density of whatever material is on top of you, multiplied by G, the gravitational acceleration, H, the total height of that column of material. And this is how we would find the pressure 
at a depth below the surface of, say, some liquid. In this case, we're going to talk about water. And it's going to be this equation that we're going to use to solve for that example that I posed over there. So, question. Um, the mass density, which is rho, mm -hmm. um, that, is that, that's, you said that's the same idea as the density that we sort of learned like, in yeah. previous classes? So, for like air pressure, it's, there's like different, like different atoms in the air. It's like, it's not just one type of density. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, nitrogen has a different density than oxygen. Well, if you want to do that for air, what you would do is a ratio. Okay. You would say 78% is based upon the molecular weight okay. of nitrogen, 21% is based upon the molecular weight of oxygen, mm -hmm. and then the other fractions that you would get. And so it would be a weighted ratio. Right. Or, and then for like water, it's just one. Because the it depends, of, you know, fresh water, salt water, right. okay. uh, different salinities such as, say, the Black Sea mm -hmm. has a higher salinity rate versus something that's almost completely fresh water. So, but basically it's about you know, one. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so at the atmospheric pressure, we're only um, limited to the atoms bound by gravity? Yeah. Because <laughs> nothing else can weigh down on us. But like, we, like, where do you stop? Yeah. 50% of our atmosphere lies within the first three miles, and 99.9% .9 of our atmosphere lies within the first 15 miles. So anything above that is count. Which is part of the reason if you're a mountain climber, why if you only get to about three miles and you still got, say, two and a half miles left to go, the oxygen level is gonna start depleting because you've now been reduced by half of your available oxygen supply. Okay, so with this question here, as a numerical example, a scuba diver is in a lake of water at a depth of eight meters. Let's find A, the pressure. So just from that equation, the pressure here, let's call it P at the bottom, where the scuba diver is, not necessarily the bottom of the lake, but at eight meters below. That's equal to the atmospheric pressure plus rho G H. So that's gonna be equal to let me just approximate as 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared as the atmospheric pressure plus, and now we're dealing with complete, thinking of a complete fresh water source. That's why I said as a lake. So a fresh water source, water has a mass density that's going to be 1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meters cubed. So 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed is the density of pure water multiplied by g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, and the height here is eight meters. So this first term remains the same, nothing is happening. The second term, if we evaluate this, is 0 0.784 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. And thus, if we add them together, the atmospheric pressure, 1.01, .01, and the pressure due to the weight of water at a depth of eight meters of 0.784 times 10 to the fifth. What we end up getting is that this is going to be approximately 1.79 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared, which is basically the same as 1.79 times 10 to the fifth pascals, which is approximately 1.8 atmospheres go through everything there. So looking at this, you know, body of fresh water, where we're approximating it's in fact pure water, so in fact for anything that isn't pure water, meaning just not H2O, which everything, including tap water, is not pure water, it's slightly above this number, but we're approximating as pure water. At eight meters below the depth, the additional pressure there is 0.8 atmospheres. So if you went a little bit further than that, say about 10 meters, you would end up feeling at that point 10 meters below the surface, a pressure that's about double what you're feeling right now. And as you get farther and farther down, the pressure drastically increases more and more and more and more. Which one here? Oh, this? 
This is rho GH. Oh, okay. That's rho GH. So your own surface area when you're underwater doesn't matter if, if because it's not factored in. No. But in air, like if you're above the surface of water, like on ground, your own surface area does come into play, or not even even still it doesn't. Only when you're describing really forces. Okay. But in this general equation, it doesn't come in because notice we cancel it out. Right. But that leads us to now the idea of force. So if we now look at the idea of force, which I asked for part B, what's the total force on the back of the person? Assuming the back is a perfect rectangle of 60 by 50 centimeters. Well, oh, what is the total force, let's say, due to water alone? So what is the total force due to the water alone on the person's back? If we did that, clearly we just found the pressure due to water is what we just found in the second part, 0.784 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. That was the second part. This was due to the water alone. This, the first part was due to the atmosphere. Well, what do we know? Pressure is equal to force divided by area. So therefore, the force due to water alone is going to be equal to the pressure due to water alone multiplied by the area. And if we end up doing this, this is going to be 0.784 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. The area here is going to be 0.6 times 0.5 meters squared. Because remember, I converted from centimeters to meters. And thus, the total force due to water alone on this diver's back is going to be 2.35 times 10 to the fourth newtons. Let me put that in perspective for you, what this force on the person's back due to water alone is. And this is just below 8 meters. Remember, the force here is due to the weight. Weight is mg. So let me divide this by g. 9.8 meters per second squared. If I do that, if I divide this force by g, what I'm finding is the effective mass of the water, and this is 2,400 kilograms, which is approximately 5,275 pounds, which is about 2.6 tons. So if you're a diver, just eight meters below the surface. And remember, eight meters, that's going to be on the order of about, you know, times three and a third. Uh, oh, about 26 feet below the surface of the water. If you're below 26 feet below the surface of the water, then pure water, then there's an effective force. Say, if this was on your back and that was your approximate surface area, you have an approximate force that's equivalent to 2.6 tons that's being exerted on yourself. That's just an unbelievable amount. And luckily, we are buoyant. Otherwise, clearly every time we went in the water and went too far, we would be crushed by the overwhelming water that exists there. So thank goodness for buoyancy in this case. How do you get a row on part A? We're here. That's just a known constant. So it's a, the mass density, so that's just a constant. For pure water, it's 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. It's, that's just the way it is. Are we always going to give it a constant? If I give you something I want you to calculate, then yes. Because everything has it. If I said, uh, what's the mass density of, say, um, liquid mercury, any types of liquid, then I would give you that. And they're all different. because it's still a total downward weight. Remember, we're not talking about anything moving side to side. We're just talking about, and in terms of vectors, force is a vector, so pressure is a vector. So any breeze that's happening here on the surface doesn't mitigate the total column, the weight that's being directed downward. But strong waves would affect it, right? 
Not if you're below the surface. If you're below the surface, it doesn't have any effect. So, for example, if there's a hurricane above you, or say a tsunami is occurring above you and you're far enough below the water, you feel nothing. So it's just as calm as before and you're just feeling the total weight. Now maybe it could be that if the height changes, you could have momentary changes in pressure, say such as a wave comes and as it's coming in, suddenly there's a larger column of water, say a crest over you, you have to add that additional amount, and maybe as it leaves, it depletes some, so your depth is slightly different, then there could be some instantaneous changes, but your average would remain the same. So all of this is just instantaneous stuff, but if you're far enough below the water level, which you don't have to be that far, all of these surface effects, wind, breezes, waves, are meaningless. But of course, let's say you tethered yourself to say the sea floor, and then maybe not all the way in the middle, but say somewhere near the shore, high tide and low tide. That means directly above you, at high tide there's more water above you, at low tide there's less. So in that case, the pressure would change at the bottom due to this effect. But of course, if you're far enough below, then the distances that are changing of 10 meters on the surface might be nothing if you're, say, 1,000 meters below or even more. So if you're a kilometer or more below, high tide, low tide, once again, is meaningless to you. But if you're right near the surface, then that would, of course, matter to you. Well, I guess if there was a hurricane and the atmospheric pressure changed drastically, you would take that into account. So the force of ear in your, like now, the force of ear on you is not going to help you in any degree? If you're in the water, and let's say regular normal ideas, the total pressure would be the atmosphere plus the weight of that water, yeah. or the pressure due to the weight. If, say, there was a storm problem and the pressure changed, or either the pressure increased or decreased, then instantaneously while that storm was there, you would just replace the atmospheric pressure with the pressure of the atmosphere due to the storm. I don't know, I was referring to the force. I'm saying. The Which force? force? That you, the, the example that you just did, mm -hmm. uh, force of the water. The force of the water. Oh, well, that doesn't change at all, because that has something to do with the atmosphere. So, so you, when you ask the force, you're asking for the force of the water, not the force of the... Notice the what I said. What's the total force of the water due to alone? And I only took this value. So I didn't even account for the pressure of the atmosphere. You could do it for both. Yeah, if I said what's the total force on you, then instead of 0.784, it would be 1.79 okay. on you. But that's okay. Say, say, say there's a box or a solid box on the surface that far deep, would it be possible to push because what the normal force would equal that amount of pressure? The force on you? You really can't use it in terms of normal force there because you're now immersed in a fluid. And fluids have, you know, the friction in a fluid is completely less. So that would just be a, if you can apply a necessary horizontal force to overcome any friction, say, on the sea floor, that's fine. But of course, things move on the sea floor all the time, at the bottom of the oceans all the time, at a very great depth. So otherwise, nothing would be able to move. But for example, uh, octopi. <coughs> And clearly move things at the bottom. That's how they make their little um, huts and shelters. They just sort of flip over rocks and other debris they hide underneath. And while some of them might be more powerful than us, per se, uh, it is not impossible to do. So the idea, the ideas of friction, as we were talking in an inclined plane, is completely different in this respect. No. no. So that, that's just a. If it did, it would be on such a slight level that it's completely ignorable for us. Okay. Last question. <laughs> no, no, that doesn't matter. Either. No, no, it's di it's displacing water. But uh, it do doesn't really matter. But it's floating. So the amount that it's pushing down is equivalent to the amount that the water is pushing up. Otherwise, it would sink. If it sinks, then it's going to sink right down on you and weigh down on you. But as long as it's floating, 
the weight that it's applying downward would be balanced by the buoyancy force it has, and thus the net force in this location is zero, and thus it would not propagate downward. Okay. With that in mind, I want to talk about one last thing for today, and we will continue it in our next lecture. And that idea is Pascal's principle. So Pascal, very important individual in terms of fluid dynamics, and also in terms of mathematics. And if any of you have learned old computer uh, programming codes, of course, there's the Pascal computer code and Turbo Pascal. And those are the ones which really replaced uh, basic, or basic was such as 10 start, 20 command, 30 command, and Pascal was seen as being better because it just had begin, and you wrote your program, and then you wrote end. So that was basically the idea for that. But of course now we have C, C++, C++, Java, etc. But Pascal's principle. So this basically says that pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished. That's important to undiminished. Every point in the fluid and to the walls of the container. So This basically is going to end up being coming for the world is the basic idea of hydraulics. Where hydraulics is using, in this case, water, just because water is a plentiful liquid fluid on the earth, you can get it anywhere. I guess not the desert, but you can get it anywhere. It's a plentiful fluid, and basically what you're doing is you're exerting force on one part of this fluid of water. And what you end up doing by your geometry is that pressure, as it says here, applied to one part, will then be instantaneously applied, undiminished, and transmitted that pressure to every other point. And thus, a small amount of force applied at one level, creating a specific amount of pressure, will create that same amount of pressure at a different point. Because notice it says pressure is transmitted undiminished to every point which will end up creating an enormous force. And for this, the basic idea, as I was alluding to, is that an incompressible fluid, such as what water is, it cannot be compressed. For this incompressible fluid, pressure is transmitted instantaneously. Let's look at the idea of a simple hydraulic situation. Okay.
this column here is having an area, surface area A1. Let me call this having a surface area A2. Now this is immersed in a fluid, let's say in this case water. I'll show you the idea of valves here. So in particular, this valve here is making sure that no water can go to the left. It's stopping it, so it's a stopper. Here, I've removed the valve here, which before, if I put it in place, no fluid could get beyond this to the right. But by removing this, by opening up the valve, fluid now can flow to the right. So all of this is a fluid. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to apply a force downward on surface area A1. Let me call this force 1. Well, as we learn, force is equal to pressure times area. So because there's an area here, there will be a pressure applied. Where will the pressure be applied at first? The pressure will be applied, in this case, upward. Let me just call it P. And the reason for that is simple. Think of a balloon. So if we go to another idea, a balloon. A balloon is held together because all the molecules in this balloon are exerting an outward pressure, and the air is doing an inward pressure. And as long as they're in balance with each other, that balloon will remain stable. However, if you have a little kid, and he, lose, he or she loses her balloon, that balloon starts floating all the way up into the sky, and you seem to have lost it forever, eventually it will pop. And that kid will cry. <laughs> they lost their little balloon. But why will it happen? Because as you're going higher and higher and higher, there's less atmosphere. Less atmosphere means less weight. Less weight means less pressure. And eventually, the outward pressure of the gas in the balloon will overcome the pressure from the atmosphere. And when that happens, it's going to pop and explode. So in this same reason, at first, the pressure is applied opposite there. But notice what we see. Because you're pushing down, and there's a force you have to push down. So consider you're pushing down, say you have a, a flotation device, and you're pushing it down on the water surface. Well, it's hard to push it down. That, in fact, is due to the buoyancy force resisting you, but that's an upward pressure, because force and pressure are in the same direction. But now we get to Pascal's principle here. Pascal's principle here says, that pressure is implied to enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished and for an incompressible fluid like water instantaneously. So it's being transmitted undiminished and instantaneously to every other point in the fluid and the walls in the container. Which means if we look in the extreme level up here, then we see that same pressure, that same pressure P. So if this was, say, one atmosphere, this is one atmosphere of pressure as well. It's being exerted to all points, and the case that we're interested in is the upward part over here. So let's say that you had a car over here. Not a very nice car, but a car. So how, in fact, at showrooms, or I'd say the mechanics, do they, in fact, or any elevators, do they lift the car up? Well, they do it through this principle. They apply a downward force on one area, on one column of water that's connected to a larger column, meaning it has a larger surface area. And as we're about to see, that will apply not only an upward pressure, but an enormous force as well. So with this, we have a ratio. And the ratio is that the force one being applied downward over here, divided by the surface area one, has to be equivalent to force two. So in this case, what we're going to have here is a force two being applied upward. Force two divided by A2. And if you do this correctly, let's solve for F2 since that's what I'm interested in here. F2 is equal to A2 divided by A1 times F1. And the important thing is, if A2 is greater than A1, then F2 is greater than F1. And so by applying a small downward force onto a small area, say a column of water, you are then basically the force here. What is F1? 
F1 is just equivalent to pressure times area 1. And that's the main thing. Force 2 is equal to that same pressure times area 2. But because the pressure is instantaneously transmitted undiminished to every point, just the pressure, this is the same pressure here, which now gives an upward force. And that upward force is balanced here. So a small amount of force can be drastically magnified if A2 is much greater than A1. So in terms of a car, let's say a car is about this big in terms of its surface area. So this is about, say, two meters by half a meter. If you apply enough downward force onto a very small area, then the magnitudes of the ratio, say this area to this area is ginormous, and that small amount of force that you've applied now gets magnified to the point where it can now create a large enough force to lift a macroscopic object, such as a car. And this is the basic idea behind cranes. This is the basic idea behind bulldozers. Everything that we have in our society uses hydraulics. And this is all based upon Pascal's principle with this ratio. So um, the amount of force is dependent on the height that you push down, right? Because before you derive pressure in like a column like that, it is PGH. So depending on how how much height you push down, that sort of it's going to increase the amount of force that's being applied on the opposite end. Not necessarily, no. So that was just looking at an open container, so okay. a huge container or a lake, and looking at what's the pressure down here. The pressure is down here is due to the column of water plus the atmosphere. I mean, if I wanted to find the pressure right here, for example, if I knew that this was, say, P1 and this is P2, then if this is a height H, then I would say that P2 is equal to P1 plus rho GH. Right. Like this. But that's not what I'm interested in in terms of Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle is just is if you have some enclosed container so meaning water can't escape from this area. That's why I put the valve right here. <clears throat> if in closed container, as you're applying a pressure to one point of it, that gets transmitted undiminished to every other point there and to the walls of the container. So that same pressure P is being exerted here, 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 on these walls, down here as well, on the sides of these walls, every point. And in terms of an incompressible fluid, like water, it's being transmitted instantaneously. So a little change right here is magnifying if A2 is much greater than A1. Mm -hmm. okay. Is the work done in the first, in the first force conserved? The force done in the energy gain on moving the heart? It would be net zero. So in that case, if you were looking at work, for example, or work is force times distance. So you're literally, say, pushing this down, say, a distance d. So if it was originally, say, here, it would fall to this distance d. Let me call that d1. This one here, let's say it was initially here, and it got raised a distance d2. You would say the work here is just f1 d1, which has an absolute value. The work here is going to be f2 d2 and they're the same. So one is positive, one is negative, and the network is zero. So as long as the, as the amount, the, dip, the height is remaining the same, the force is going to be the same? Yes. No, wait a second, getting back to your problem. Yes, if the forces are the same, the distances are the same. But notice here that they both are related to the same pressure, but different uh, surface areas. So typically, you would not have that, because you can't have the forces being the same, in fact. Because unless their surface areas were identically the same, then you would have the same force. But the forces relate to the same exact pressure multiplied by that. So different values will give you different answers. Okay, last question.
Well, the shape of the, you mean overall, like what I'm doing in this area? Yeah, really nothing. I mean, if, if you do it in a poor way where, say, I dig under the ground and now I have to fight against gravity to get back up, then that might, but just in general, no. Okay, guys, before you leave, please take these assignments. These are homeworks one, two, or three. This is homework four. This 